Hi, everyone. My name is Vic Coley. I am a neurosurgery resident at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. In conjunction with Dr. Vincent Wang, faculty and director of neurotrauma at our institution, I'm excited to talk today about intracranial pressure and some of the evidence behind our current guidelines as part of the CNS Neurosurgery 100 video series. So to start, the importance of ICP was recognized more than two centuries ago by a scientist named Alexander Monroe. His contributions led to a hypothesis known as the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine. This doctrine holds that because the brain is enclosed in a non-expandable skull, the sum of volumes of brain, CSF, and blood is constant. When the volume of one intracranial component increases, there's a compensatory displacement of the other two. When this compensation is exhausted, a linear increase in volume leads to an exponential increase in ICP. And without treatment, acute intracranial hypertension may be rapidly fatal due to brain compression, ischemia, and herniation. In the modern day, more and more investigators are identifying the complexity of ICP in which the Monroe-Kelly doctrine may be an oversimplification. So the normal range of ICP varies with age. For adults and older children, the normal range is generally considered less than 10 to 15. The threshold for intervention is not black and white. The most recent Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines recommends treating ICP above 22 from level 2B evidence that suggests values above this level are associated with increased mortality. Interestingly, this number was previously 20 in the third edition guidelines, which was based on several class three studies that found levels above 20 were associated with increased mortality. This was changed to 22 based on a class two retrospective study that used chi-squared analysis on 459 patients to identify that threshold for reduced mortality and favorable outcomes. It's important to note that these studies were not comparing outcomes based on varying thresholds of intervention but observed outcomes based on varying levels of ICP alone. With that, there are many potential causes of elevated ICP. It may be the result of mass effect and cerebral edema, such as from a tumor, hematoma, or infarct, increased production or decreased reabsorption of CSF, such as obstructive hydrocephalus, increased blood volume, and other causes, such as idiopathic intracranial hypertension or metabolic issues. ICP monitoring is an integral yet controversial aspect of the management of patients with TBI. Historically speaking, ICP monitoring has been a standard of care in patients with severe TBI. In prior editions of the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, uh, there have been controversy on whether ICP monitoring improves outcomes since in the developed world, it is routinely used leading to a lack of equipos for assigning patients to a non-monitored arm. This prompted the BEST TRIP trial, which randomized 324 patients across six hospitals in Bolivia and Ecuador into treatment informed by ICP monitoring in the form of intraparenchymal monitor versus treatment informed by imaging and clinical exam. The trial found no significant difference in six-month mortality, extended Glasgow outcome scale, or composite of 21 measures. These results did not support the hypothesized superiority of ICP monitoring over clinical assessment in this environment. What is interesting is that in this study, the non-ICP monitored group did undergo more interventions than the monitored group. In comparison, a retrospective cohort study on 10,000 patients across the US and Canada assessed the relationship between ICP monitoring and mortality. The study found that ICP monitoring was associated with significantly lower in-hospital mortality, especially in patients under the age of 65. However, the variability in mortality was explained by only a small portion of the variability in ICP monitoring, an R-squared value of 9.9%. The fourth edition of the BTF guideline states that management of severe TBI patients using information from ICP monitoring is recommended to reduce in-hospital and two-week post-injury mortality. Interestingly, there are less established guidelines on ICP monitoring in non-TBI settings. In fact, ICP monitoring is not mentioned in the Neurocritical Care Society guidelines on subarachnoid hemorrhage. For intracranial hemorrhage, there are guidelines for monitoring from the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association. They recommend that patients with a GCS less than or equal to eight, those with clinical evidence of transtentorial herniation, or those with significant IVH or hydrocephalus might be considered for ICP monitoring and treatment. Their second recommendation states that ventricular drainage as treatment for hydrocephalus is reasonable in patients with decreased level of consciousness. 
Now, the NCS and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine released a consensus statement in 2014 that states that ICP and CPP monitoring are recommended as part of protocol-driven care in patients who are at risk of elevated ICP based on clinical and or imaging features, um, that monitoring be used to guide medical and surgical interventions and to detect life-threatening imminent herniation. However, the threshold value of ICP is uncertain and that indications and methods for ICP monitoring should be tailored to the specific diagnosis. There are a variety of modalities available to monitor ICP in the clinical practice, including external ventricular drain, intraparenchymal bolt monitors, and non-invasive monitors such as transcranial Doppler imaging, optic nerve sheath diameter via ultrasound, and automated pupillometry. This table from Harry Luke et al. summarized some of the key characteristics of some of the aforementioned ICP monitors. External ventricular drain or EVD is currently the gold standard for measuring ICP as it's an accurate, available, and a reliable method of monitoring ICP. It can be recalibrated without manipulation of the catheter and importantly permits therapeutic drainage of CSF. Some drawbacks include risk of infection, malposition, occlusion, and hemorrhage. Intraparenchymal monitor is the second most common device used for ICP monitoring. There are two main types, solid state devices based on pressure sensitive resistors or those that incorporate a fiber optic design. These are usually placed in the right or left frontal region at a depth of two centimeters. They're also widely available and highly accurate with a lower risk of infection and hemorrhage compared to EVD. Some drawbacks include a higher cost, lack of therapeutic drainage, drift, delicate fiber optic cables that may lead to mechanical problems. Transcranial Doppler is a promising ultrasound-based technique for the non-invasive assessment of ICP and CPP measurements. The ICP is derived from models using blood velocity data and variations in TCD waveform morphologies. Benefits include high availability, uh, no risk of infection or hemorrhage, and low cost. Drawbacks include limited accuracy in some studies, operator dependency, and uh, non-continuous recordings. The optic nerve sheath diameter is another non-invasive ICP monitoring modality that is convenient and can be rapidly performed at bedside. The optic nerve is surrounded by a subarachnoid space, which expands in the presence of elevated ICP and thus can be measured by ultrasound and correlated with ICP. It's also highly available and shares similar advantages from being non-invasive in terms of cost and risk profile. It's also operator dependent though. Lastly, automated pupillometry has been increasingly used in the ICU setting in recent years. Abnormal neurologic pupillary indrix or NPI has been shown to be associated with elevated ICP. Interestingly, one study by Chen et al found that pupil abnormalities were detectable 16 hours before important increases in ICP, suggesting that NPI may provide early warning of intracranial hypertension. Emerging technologies um, are being innovated, including other non-invasive techniques and wireless data transfer. Once elevated ICP has been diagnosed from clinical exam, imaging, or on ICP monitoring, it is essential to know how to manage elevated ICP and prevent its complications. There are many therapeutic modalities, including raising head of bed, osmolar therapy, anesthetics, and sedatives, hypothermia, CSF drainage, such as from an EVD and surgical decompression. Starting with osmolar therapy, the latest BTF guideline states that although hyperosmolar therapy may lower intracranial pressure, there is insufficient evidence about the effects on clinical outcomes to support a specific recommendation or to support the use of any specific hyperosmolar agent for patients with a severe TBI. The NCS guideline includes two conditional statements on low quality evidence that suggest um, using hypertonic sodium solutions over mannitol for the initial management of elevated ICP or cerebral edema in patients with a TBI, and that neither hypertonic saline nor mannitol be used with the expectation for improving neurologic outcomes, and the use of mannitol as an effective alternative in patients with a TBI unable to receive hypertonic sodium solution. As far as which osmolar therapy to choose, there are several studies that compare hypertonic saline versus mannitol. Hypertonic saline has some theoretical advantages 
um, over mannitol, including lack of volume depletion, leading to a proposal of being a safer option in, in trauma patient, as well as having a slightly higher re reflection coefficient, proposing that it may be less likely to leak into brain tissues in patients with an intact blood-brain barrier. In one systemic uh, review of six trials enrolling 287 patients found no difference between hypertonic saline and mannitol in terms of efficacy and safety and long-term management of acute TBI. Another retrospective study of 50 patients um, found that hypertonic saline to be more effective than mannitol in lowering ICP and IC length of stay, but no difference in short-term mortality. Focusing on hypertonic saline, the recommended dosage, method of delivery, and sodium target have yet to be clearly defined. In one systematic review of 15 studies with 535 TBI patients who received various hypertonic saline concentrations, the lower concentration strongly correlated with ICP reduction. Also, the COBE trial in 2021 randomized 370 patients with moderate to severe TBI in France into two treatment groups. One received continuous infusion of 20% hypertonic saline in standard of care and the other standard of care alone. The results showed that continuous 20% hypertonic saline did not significantly improve ICP six month GOSE score or mortality at six months. Interestingly, patients in the infusion group had fewer incidents of ICP elevation, but, they went, but when they were weaned off, appeared to have a rebound ICP effect. As for method of delivery, both bolus and continuous infusion have both uh, been shown to decrease ICP. However, there is more evidence supporting the use of hypertonic saline as a bolus compared to continuous infusion. And lastly, as far as sodium target, there are conflicting reports in literature, currently no consensus. Therapy target uh, may best be tailored uh, based on the individual patient. Anesthetics, analgesics, and sedatives are an important treatment modality used in acute TBI for prophylaxis and control of ICP and seizures. The potential mechanism of benefit include prevention of unnecessary movements, coughing and straining, suppression of metabolism, alteration of cerebrovascular tone, and protective mechanisms such as inhibition of radical oxygen species production. Potential adverse effects include hypotension, decreased cardiac output, hypoxia from intrapulmonary shunting, as well as metabolic acidosis and rhabdomyolysis in certain agents such as propofol. The BTF guideline states that uh, administration of barbiturates to induce birth suppression measured by EEG as prophylaxis against the development of intracranial hypertension is not recommended. High dose barbiturate administration is recommended to control elevated ICP refractory, the maximum standard medical and surgical treatment. And although propofol is recommended for the control of ICP, it is not recommended for improvement in mortality or six month outcomes. Caution is required as high dose propofol can produce significant morbidity. So overall, there's a lack of high quality evidence on these agents, which is why they're typically employed in cases of elevated ICP refractory to other modalities. Hypothermia is another modality in the management of elevated ICP that is a controversial issue. In theory, hypothermia decreases cerebral metabolism and may reduce cerebral blood volume, leading to lower ICP. The current BTF guideline states that early short-term prophylactic hypothermia is not recommended to improve outcomes in patients with a diffuse injury. One randomized control study by Clifton et al. investigated the impact of 48 hours of early hypothermia to 33 degrees Celsius versus normothermia in 97 patients with severe TBI in U.S. and Canada. The study found no significant difference in mortality, poor outcomes, or complications between the two groups. In fact, the trial was terminated early due to futility. There are no recommendations with respect to target temperature, length of cooling, and head only versus systemic cooling due to insufficient evidence. Lastly, cerebral edema can be from primary or secondary brain injury and lead to brain herniation resulting in disability or death. Decompressive craniectomy is performed with the intention to relieve intracranial pressure and prevent herniation. The BTF guideline updated in 2020 states that secondary decompressive craniectomy performed for late refractory ICP elevation is recommended to improve mortality and favorable outcomes. Um, although performed for early refractory ICP elevation is not recommended to improve mortality and favorable outcomes. 
a larger uh, frontotemporal parietal decompressive craniectomy, not less than 12 by 15 centimeters or 15 centimeters in diameter is recommended over a small decompressive craniectomy for reduced mortality and improved neurosurgical outcomes in patients with severe TBI. And secondary decompressive craniectomy performed as a treatment for either early or late refractory ICP elevation is suggested to reduce ICP and duration of intensive care, though the relationship between these effects and favorable outcome is uncertain. There are two landmark randomized control trials that investigate decompressive craniectomy in patients with TBI, the DECRA trial and rescue ICP trial. In fact, the results of the rescue ICP trial are the reason why the fourth edition BTF guidelines were updated again in 2020 for decompressive craniectomy. The purpose of both trials was to compare outcomes between patients with TBI who underwent surgical decompression versus standard medical therapy alone. The DECRA trial enrolled 155 patients with severe TBI measured by GCS 3 to 8 and refractory elevated ICP greater than 20 for 15 minutes. The rescue ICP trial enrolled 408 patients with TBI and refractory elevated ICP greater than 25 for 1 to 12 hours. The DECRA trial took place in 15 sites in Australia, New Zealand, and Saudi Arabia, while the rescue ICP trial took place in 52 centers across 20 countries. Of note, the intervention for DECRA trial was bifrontotemporal parietal decompressive craniectomy within three days, while the rescue ICP intervention was a hemicraniectomy or bifrontal craniectomy within 10 days. The DECRA trial found that surgery was associated with a decreased burden of intracranial hypertension and shorter stays in the ICU, but worse outcome on the extended GOS scale at six months. In comparison, the rescue ICP trial found that surgery was associated with better ICP control and lower mortality at six months, but higher rates of vegetative state and severe disability. So in summary, elevated ICP is a potentially devastating complication of neurologic injury. There are multiple causes of elevated ICP. The monitoring of ICP is controversial in both neurotrauma and non-trauma settings. There's a variety of existing and emerging technologies for ICP monitoring. And lastly, the evidence supporting the management modalities of elevated ICP is evolving. Thank you so much for your time. And here are select references from our presentation. Thank you.